and you're live. All right. Good afternoon, good early evening, wherever you're listening to this. My name is Barb Chambliss, and I'm going to spend the next hour on the topic of why and how to do conscious acts of peacemaking. This comes about from a book I recently published called, um, where I've interviewed women from all over the world. And the book is called Women Peacemakers, What We Can Learn From Them. And in this book, you get um, entertained. The women's stories are phenomenal. There are 15 of them in this book. You get educated about how, not only how the women made peace, in their settings, but their advice about what advice would they give someone that wanted to be a peacemaker? And also my view of what these women do across the board that constitutes peacemaking sort of for anyone that wants to do it. We'll go over that quite extensively at the end. And the last thing it does is invite. It invites you, the reader, or I've uh, also uh, recorded the book, so the audio listener, to take on an act of peacemaking of your own based on what you've learned from the book and the women, and then write up um, one or two page summary of what you did and email it to me. I'm still collecting peacemaker stories. I would love to have peacemaker stories from men and women and children and prisons and refugee camps, any acts of peacemaking that are going on in the world, I feel that one of my jobs for being here is to let the world about how much conscious peacemaking is going on today. So just a tiny bit about me. Um, I've always wanted to know how peace was made. When I went to high school and college, um, a lot of the guys that I went to high school and college with got drafted and um, they went away to boot camp and the two weeks they came home between boot camp and their assignments to Vietnam, um, they sure could talk about how war was made. And I kept going like, wait a minute, how, how is peace made? I, I want to see the balance of this, the other side. And then, uh, and then tragically, some of them came home and um, you saw the results of war on individuals. I then kept choosing occupations that kind of sought this out, although it wasn't a terribly conscious pathway. I learned to be a trauma therapist. For 40 years, I've been a trauma therapist and a mediator. I've taught over 500 children in Western Colorado and adults how to be mediators. We've set up several schools that are what we call peace place schools. So we teach the lunchroom ladies and the bus drivers and the parents and the school administration, the language of conflict resolution. And we train fifth graders to actually do conflict resolution in their classrooms. Um, I also have been the head of an organization called the Center for Conflict Resolution in the Roaring Fork Valley in Aspen, Colorado, where 200 of us got trained and did free mediation as long as our grant ran out. Um, then at one point, um, I actually ended up at, with the opportunity to do a PhD. And I decided, I think I'll study peacemaking there. Um, so at the Fielding Institute, where I was a, a PhD candidate, I chose peacemaking as the topic. And um, when you're in a PhD, you have to fill a gap in the literature. So I looked around and there was quite a bit of literature about male peacemakers, uh, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, um, in any number of Martin Luther King, but there wasn't very much information on women peacemakers except those that had won Nobel Peace Prizes. And when I thought I would, I would use them as my subjects, I couldn't find them. Aung San Suu Kyi was in her first long period of house arrest. Rigoberta Menchu tomb was in hiding because it was so dangerous for her to have gotten that commendation. So I changed my mind and I said, why don't I simply study ordinary people who do acts of peacemaking? Ordinary meaning not so famous. 
um, so it really turned out to be ordinary women doing extraordinary acts of peacemaking. Um, I interviewed nine for my dissertation. I got hooked on the joy of interviewing these people and I've now interviewed nearly 60 women all over the world. So I'm going to bring to you um, some of the information from my travels, my 30 years of travels. In order to do the PhD, I had to define I knew my subjects, it was gonna be ordinary people, but I had to define peace. And um, I will tell you from the get-go that this isn't the kind of peace that you would pair up with the word war. So it's not like war and peace. It's also not like inner peace, although both of those are very, very important topics to research. This is a, about a proactive kind of peace. And it is about ordinary people creating opportunities for other people to empower themselves. I'm going to say it again because that's really important to the topic of today and to um, your opportunity to do a peacemaking task if you want. This is about ordinary people creating opportunities for other people to empower themselves. And you'll hear it, I'm gonna go through a few of the stories in the book, you'll hear it in some of the information that's provided for you. So um, the committee I, I had was a fantastic committee, included an amazing woman named Elise Bolding, who was the external examiner, who was real, really inspirational guidance for me. But they said, you know, this is on the edge of hard science. So we're gonna set up some pretty good rigor for you as you do this PhD. And we want you not just to have, well, we need to know who your subject matters are gonna be. And in order to do that, I had to develop some sort of definition of peace. And so uh, I developed the most visual, simple definition of peace that I could. And this is what it is. If you put your hands out in front of you as if someone were gonna pour your hands full of cold, clear water, and they're equal with each other. This is my definition of peace. If this is going on, it is not peace because there's a dominant and a subordinate element to it. So I would say to someone, if this is peace because it's mutual, it's equal, and this is not, do you know any woman in the world today that is beginning to make this happen? And it turned out to be magic. I got so many nominations for women to interview that I, uh, one of the hardest things about my life is that I will not have enough time to interview all of them. So um, I just started scouting around anywhere. And I said, um, I went to a theater uh, in a nearby town where there were five Irish brothers um, doing a concert. And I went backstage afterwards and I said to them, my name is Barb Chambliss. I'm doing a dissertation on peacemaking. This is peace, this is not. Do you know any woman in Ireland that is making this happen? And their answer was, oh no, we're the musicians. We don't know nothing about that. But our sister Fanula, she is a disc jockey in Dublin. Here's her telephone number. Okay, I thought, so the next morning I called Fanula, and Fanula had two recommendations for me, one of which you will hear about today. So um, I asked each, uh, so the other thing that they said is you need two nominations, one from someone else, and we don't know who those people are, so we don't know how valid that nomination is. The second thing is you have to have a, the woman has to nominate herself. And that was really hard much harder than getting the first nomination. Um, I would call up, for instance, uh, I called up Fanula's contacts and I said, my name is Barb Chambliss. I'm doing a PhD in peacemaking. Could I interview you for how you're doing your work? And to the woman, they said, I would love to have somebody interview me about my work. Mo most of their work was done in very, um, not very well-known arenas on purpose because of the safety. But they said, yes, please come interview me, but I don't think I'm a peacemaker. I'm a nun. 
or I'm a sculptor, or I'm a doctor. And I went like, mm, how am I going to meet this criteria that I have to have the woman nominator so? And my high school age son was great. He said, mom, look, ask him their definition of peace and then ask them if they do anything to bring that about. So those were the first two of my interview questions. Every woman I've interviewed has gotten the same list of questions and those were the first two. So when they defined peace and then they would go like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. I do that kind of thing. I bring that about. I would just look at them and I would say, well, it seems to me like you actually fit the description of a peacemaker. And then I would be very quiet. And I would watch right in front of me. It was one of the most stunning parts of the interview process. I would watch them take on the mantle of being a peacemaker, willingly. No one, with the exception of one person, asked me to not call her a peacemaker or publish her story. So I asked the women those two questions. I asked them, how did you find your work? How did you fund your work? How did you stick with your work when it got rough? How did you, um, what, 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 can you paint a picture for me with your words of what the world would look like if your concept of peace were in operation today? I asked them, what role, if any, do you think forgiveness plays in peacemaking? And I asked them, what advice would you give someone that wanted to become a peacemaker? So in this book, um, I took 15 women that I've interviewed and asked them those questions and um, have put their stories here for you to read. About halfway through that process, one of the women who's actually in the book um, invited me to be a volunteer at a camp for Bosnian refugee kids. I actually thought she was, she was from Los Angeles and I thought, gosh, I don't, I don't know if I could do what to do for that, but I could go cook in their kitchen or something like that. And she said, nope, that's exactly, that's great. We need volunteers. In fact, this is not only about working, doing something for the children, it's doing something for the volunteers because this is a reciprocal process. So she said, and by the way, it's not in Los Angeles, it's in, it's in Croatia, and we're going to have 80 um, people that have just barely made it through this war. 60 of them will be kids. So I went and volunteered at this camp and saw what war had done to these children. I saw what it did to their sense of trust, their sense of betrayal, their sense of safety, their sense of their importance in the world. And then at the end of the camp, the kids begged us to go home with them. They, and, and that meant going to Sarajevo or to a town named Tuzla where a lot of them had been, or were refugees. And they said, we really want you to come home with us because we want you to go back home and tell people what this war, what happened in this war. We don't think anybody in the world knew about it because if they knew about it, why would they let it go on for four years? So we went to Sarajevo and to Tuzla. And then I got to see what war does to infrastructure, roads, um, windows, um, businesses. It's just devastating. It was the closest an American woman that was not in the military could ever come to experiencing what war does without, without endangering herself. It's an opportunity of a lifetime. And I came back from that trip and I said, you know what? This can no longer be an academic search. This has got to be, I have to do something about this. I have to be a peacemaker. I have to be conscious about it. And I have to wake up as many people to be conscious peacemakers as I can in my life. And that's what the rest of the book is about. Chapter 16 um, explains their answers to the question, what advice would you give somebody that wanted to become a peacemaker? Chapter 17 is my ideas of what I saw across the board and chapter 18 is that invitation. So what did I learn from these different window, women? Um, let 
let me let me tell you that in just a minute. What I just want to do now is just introduce you to one aspect of the book that um, will be helpful a little bit later on. So I had a wonderful team of women in my town that helped me edit the book, do all the graphics and the and the print setting, and market the book. And the graphic person said, Barb, this is going to cost you a lot of money to publish this book if you put all of these uh, colored photos at the beginning of each chapter. So let's put them on the, the page that's going to be colored anyway. And let's bid out someone to do black and white photos of these colored photos. So you can see this woman here. This is Cheeto Govera from Zimbabwe. That's how she looks on the front. And in her chapter, this is how she looks. So you'll be seeing some of those chapter heads today as I talk about the women. So let me talk about um, one of the Irish recommendations first. Her name is, and I'm gonna make sure that I can, um, let's see if we can do this. Make sure you can see her. So this picture is not very clear and I've left it that way because Sister Sarah was by her own description, stone blind. Um, and this is kind of how she saw the world as I interviewed her. She um, was a Catholic nun. Um, she couldn't have been more well behaved in her, in her work. Um, she went over to England and she taught art to kids. She turns out she was quite artistic herself. So she taught art, but this was the time when the Irish problems were so um, imminent, so starting up, bombs, all sorts of things between Northern and Southern Ireland and the Brits. And she volunteered to work just as an avocation to work for an organization um, that helped out the prisoners that the British took and put in jails in London. And I'm gonna read you from the book right now. Before she knew it, Sister Sarah was immersed in the work. It had started as an avocation, but now it became her full-time work. This is what she told me. I was getting all these phone calls, families, people were missing and people were disappeared. They were traveling and they hadn't arrived, this kind of thing. And it was my job to go and find them. And it was a rather terrifying job because the way I was treated by the prison guards and the establishment, everyone was afraid. Everyone was afraid to speak about the Irish people at the time because there were a lot of bombs going off and they were called persona non grata. And by sticking out your neck and helping people who were arrested, you were accused of being a member of the IRA and detained and tortured for any number of days under the Pre Prevention of Terrorism Act. I was in danger myself. I didn't know the day or the hour that the big hand would come on me. And I often wished that the phone wouldn't ring, but I had to answer the phone. I couldn't say no, but I was frightened to say yes. And I would go out to the car, drive out of the convent grounds and wonder if I would ever come back and wonder would anyone help me if it were to happen to me? Or would I end up being strip searched? So what she did was um, she would keep the spirits of these prisoners up and she uh, contacted their families because all of a sudden they would be arrested and they'd be sent to London and the jails were pretty, pretty awful at that time. So she would stay in contact with her families. If the families found enough money to come over the, across the ocean, they would, um, she would meet them. She'd find free places for them to stay. She would keep in contact, let them know what the court system was doing with their loved ones. And some of them went on fasts and died when they were in prison. And she was the one holding their hand when they died. So, she had to um, 
she had to sacrifice her own safety and her pension and her salary and a beloved career teaching art to the children. Yet she knew that her decision to do, to do so, difficult as it was, was a choice she had on a daily basis. In contrast to the prisoners with whom she worked, who were stuck in the prisons, she could pack it up any day. Her compensation for all this was the gratitude, the lasting gratitude from the families and the prisoners who continued to visit and write to her. I did some follow-up work. Let me just see if this is working here. I did some follow-up information gathering on each of these people and I wrote an epilogue and this is in Sister Sarah's epilogue. Sister Sarah was 81 at the time of our interview. Several years later, I was at a retreat for the Dances of Universal Peace in Mexico. The dances took place on the beach and anyone passing by was welcome to join. For three days, a somewhat crippled fellow watched the dances and on the fourth day, he joined us, introducing himself as Sean. After the dances, I struck up a conversation. I could tell from Sean's lilt that he was from Ireland. I mentioned I was writing a book on women peacemakers. He asked if I had interviewed any women in Ireland. Yes, I said. When I mentioned Sister Sarah's name, Sean became very quiet. To my surprise, tears began to roll down his cheeks. When I asked if he knew her, he told me that he had become crippled from being beaten by the guards in the London jail. But he said, once Sister Sarah started helping me and my family, I quit fighting them. I asked if she was still alive. No, he said, she died at the age of 82. When I asked if she was alone when she died, he replied, oh, not at all. She was surrounded by the families and friends that she had helped. She was known to us as the Joan of Arc of the British jails. So one other peacemaker that I would like to introduce you to, and I'm not sure the graphic piece is working so well here, but we'll do our best. Hmm. is going to be the story of Muffy Davis. And I think I will let you see me instead of Muffy at an angle. I guess. So Muffy is an American. She was a young girl that grew up in a town in Idaho called Sun Valley, Idaho. She was, and this is a town that was small and it nurtured and stuck behind its kids who were all skiers, but it nurtured a lot of them to go into the Olympics. And this was Muffy's whole hope for her life. She was skilled enough. She had all the backing of her parents and the whole town. All she had to do was keep winning the qualifying races so she could go on the Olympic team. And on one of those qualifying races, she um ran off she was going 50 miles an hour she went off the practice course and hit two trees broke her helmet in two and ended up paralyzed and it was crushing for her and her family and the whole town um i'm going to read you a little bit about what happened at that point I actually can tell you a little bit about what happened. She was, she went into a major depression. She had to go into rehab for a long time and she just wasn't getting anywhere in rehab. Um, and then one night when she was sleeping alone, um, she had a dream and an angel, she does it. She doesn't quite know how to describe what happened but an angel or a spirit or something came to her and said, it's all gonna be all right. You will learn to walk when you've done what you came to do in this life, you'll walk, or maybe in the next life you'll walk, but settle into your, your gift that you were given with this accident. 
So Muffy started, uh, her mother came the next day and she said, mom, don't worry, things are gonna be okay. She started learning how to do adaptive skiing. It took forever. The adaptive equipment wasn't very good at that time. So <clears throat> she found ways to help other people have hope that a disability was not the end of their world. Uh, I met her when we were in Vietnam uh, together and uh, she was helping a young boy who had, had lost both arms and one leg in a landmine accident. And um, she showed, she got a new wheelchair for him that was like her wheelchair. She mostly, it wasn't the equipment that made the difference. He was a big soccer player and Muffy's husband um, was a recreational therapist. And he said to this Vietnamese boy, you know, they're soccer balls with bells in them. So you don't have to see, you can hear them coming. And they together lifted this child's spirits so that he was willing to accept a new prosthesis, a new wheelchair, and begin to believe that he had some value in life. I'm gonna read you a section of this chapter. Muffy doesn't like having someone else's belief serve as a limitation to her or to others. She speaks at TED Talks and motivational speaker gigs to large groups to educate audiences about the abilities of person, persons with disabilities. She shows in the multiple medals that she has won skiing in the Paralympics. She shows in the multiple medals she has, uh, she, she shows in pictures of herself, water skiing, paragliding, horseback riding, scuba diving, and weight training. She also shows them pictures of her being the first woman with a disability to climb Mount Shasta, a 14,000 foot mountain. How, you might wonder, in a snow pod an arm powered device that crawls up the mountain. Muffy's metaphor for herself as a peacemaker, she says, I am a mountain climber. Muffy also loves visiting with groups of children because they aren't afraid to ask basic questions like, how do you go to the bathroom? And can you have babies? She, she feels that getting questions answered at young ages helps these children grow up without the stereotypes that many adults have. One of her most beloved audiences are the children with terminal illnesses in the Make-A-Wish Foundation. She also works one-on-one -on -one with people with disabilities to help them quit setting limits on themselves. She volunteers in the local hospitals to visit those who are newly disabled, to share her story, and to give them some hope for their own futures. She encourages them to transition their intentions from surviving to thriving and reminds them being different doesn't mean being less than. She tells them and their families how her family and friends supported her through the tough times. She also helps them learn the importance of asking for help and skills of how to do it. She brings her medals from the Paralympics and lets people try them on. How does Muffy's work constitute peacemaking? When someone loses use of their limbs, it can feel like being condemned to a prison of immobility with gravity as one's jailer. At the very least, they have lost their freedoms that they formerly had, freedoms that other people in the world have and often take for granted. It is easy to feel subordinated to those who are abled because of the habitual beliefs of oneself and of society as a whole. Muffy and her husband, Jeff, are spending their lives opening these prison doors by example, by talking, and by teaching. And finally, I wanna introduce you to a woman named, let's see if we can do the picture thing again. Her name is Shahala Wali. I'm trying to get the glare off of these things. There we go. So I'll read a little and speak a little about Shahala. Looking through one kind of lens at Shahala, she had everything going against her. She lived in Iraq, which had undergone three wars by the time she was 30 years old. 
She was a woman living in a country infiltrated by extreme religious terrorists, which made being a woman very dangerous. She was a Kurd living in a country where the president had killed many Kurds with mass chemical genocide. And the president was Saddam Hussein, who had turned on his own people with a wicked revenge for an attempt to unseat him. Hussein was also seen as an international threat, which placed a devastating set of sanctions onto Iraq that nearly decimated the economic, educational, and health conditions of the citizenry. When Hussein persisted in being a threat, the superpowers moved in with a military wrath that destroyed the physical environment, their beloved Baghdad, and killed massive numbers of innocent civilians all around Shahala. Underneath all the chaos and the ashes was a tiny seed that would become Shahala's peacemaking work. She answered an ad in a newspaper in Erbil, and it was an ad that had been put there by an American non-governmental organization called Counterpoint. There were a lot of NGOs that went over to Iraq and spent a lot of money. And frankly, many of them did not accomplish very much at all. So luck was with her when she ended up being enticed to say yes to this, to this um, advertisement and they said yes to her. So she had a wonderful mentor who was from Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which is how I found out about her. Um, and he went there and basically they, CounterPoint won't do any work unless there's a local person on the ground being mentored by an American. So they gave her four months to find out, to, to hire a staff, all local people, to find out what was needed to be um, upgraded, fixed, bro broken things fixed, and to um, do the work. So by the end of four months, I'm reading now from the chapter, beginning with nothing, Shahala and her team completed 26 reconstruction projects, a list of which when I thought about it, made me wonder how these communities had managed without such services before Shahala and her team appeared. It was clear rehabilitating buildings that had been destroyed would involve replacing windows that were all blown out by the artillery. In order to accomplish this, they had to rebuild the glass factory. They also installed drinking water networks and completed their garbage, four garbage collection projects. They supplied technical equipment to three health centers, rehabilitated three community gardens and reconstructed several schools and a mosque. When a surge of refugees arrived, her, her team built not ramshackle tents, but they made straw bale homes for them, 27. Oh no, 52 straw bale homes. When the news arrived at, the, at her office that the American forces had inadvertently cut off all access to food supplies for a large area of the city of Fallujah, Shahala and her team prepared and miraculously delivered 600 paper bags of food supplies to residents under the crosshairs of the military gunfire that never abated. When she was done, 1,400 new jobs had been created in the, in the government, quite a gift to a country with a 60 to 70% unemployment rate. More importantly, the people with whom she worked felt a sense of ownership in their work and pride in pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. She also left them with new skills in community self-determination and in conflict resolution. She had shown them a partnership between Iraq and America that was positive and constructive. The concept of civil society once again had roots in this war-torn country. She told me, perhaps the hardest relationship of all to build was that between herself and the tribal leaders. She described it. So it was pretty amazing when I went to the first community meeting. Basically, it was simple. I was in a tribal leader's house and he was inviting all the local figures, people who were considered to be important people, 20 to 30 of them. And it was amazing how they would be listening to a woman, even though I wasn't talking to them as a woman, I was talking to them as a project manager. Manager, They had so much to lose and so much to gain by trusting her. Her philosophy was to see things from their way of understanding them, 
and then elaborate it, explain it, and develop it to the end when she would add her own message. She spoke quietly to them as a fellow Iraqi, as someone like all of them who had suffered under the dictatorship of Hussein, whose family members got and heroes had been killed, whose children had been denied educations, whose communities had been ravaged by the sanctions and the occupation, and who had been isolated from the international communities. She invited them all, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, and Christian, to start taking back their futures and rebuild their communities. She simply suggested that they identify projects that they needed in their community and then give her and her team three months. If they did not like what they saw at that time, she would pack up and leave. So what, what is it that I learned from these women that I would like to pass on to you? If we take this definition of peace and this pet, pet, definition of not peace, one way to equal this whole imbalanced peace is to do this. <clears throat> A lot of that is going on today. It isn't sustainable, it doesn't last, and often it's violent. It's a revolution. You can call it a revolution, you can call it whatever you want, but it's trying to put down the power structure. What, what these women do is they try to upgrade things, not downgrade something. And they, but they don't do the upgrade. This, this is the dominant people and this is the subordinated people. They don't do this. And they don't do this. What I found that these women did, because their whole uh, modus operandi was mutual respect, they did this. And they started raising up the people. First of all, I will have to say, they always got, they always checked in to see if anybody wanted their help. And when they did, they would mesh with them, treat them the way they wanted to be treated. So it was an equal respect relationship. And then they would do this together until this began to happen. So that visual is something for you to keep in mind. If you're going to an act of peacemaking, don't do something for someone, do something with them. Um, so let's just look for a minute at the whole question of why, well, yeah, let's look at why, why do acts of peacemaking? I mean, why not do them? Why not do something else? But why is it important for there to be people doing conscious acts of peacemaker today? The first one is something that is, has to do with human nature. Every one of us is designed to either do violence, often in protection of ourselves, often for other reasons, or to treat each other with mutual respect. The quickest avenue to war is humiliation. The quickest avenue to peacemaking is respect. So we all are aware of this. We practice both of those probably in our lifetime. And the reason to do it is to keep practicing the, the peacemaking side. Don't give a lot of energy to the violence making side, to the humiliation side. Just keep filling the world with positive aspects of peacemaking until your whole neuroplasticity has more connections to do peacemaking than it does to uh, violence. Another reason is because the media, with some exceptions, is not doing a very good job of reporting peacemaking. So people don't know if there's a balance in the world or not. Um, violence sells news. And, um, and then there's some opportunities now, especially with the introduction of social media, to use the news or the social media platforms to actually create violence. 
A third reason is because the governments are not doing a very good job about um, making peace. There, um, it seems to get when you when you mix things up with politics, when you mix them up with capitalism, you um, you often get so bogged down with those dynamics that peace is just sitting there waiting to happen, and it just doesn't. So individuals are the best way, best agents to do the peacemaking. There's the book that I publish is full of quotes about peacemaking. And my favorite quote is this one by Dwight D. Eisenhower, who happened to be president when I was a little girl. He said this, I like to believe that people in the long run are going to do more to promote peace in our governments. Indeed, I think that people want peace so much that one of these days, governments had better get out of the way and let them have it. And then the final reason to do an act of peacemaking is one that I think I leave to each one of you to think about. What would it mean to you to go to bed at night knowing that you had done an act of peacemaking as opposed to nothing or as opposed to perhaps an act of violence? If every, let's just take a thousand people. If every one of those people did an act of peacemaking once a day for a week, the world would then have in it 7,000 acts of peacemaking. That would make a difference. That would be noticed. If not in the world, then within us. And also, let me just explain what I mean by uh, act, well, by conscious peacemaking. Um, I, think, I think there's quite a bit of peacemaking going on in the world all the time anyway. Often it's spontaneous. Um, often it is a one-time kind of thing. Often people don't want to call themselves peacemakers like the women didn't. They feel it's presumptuous or something like that. Um, but let's take an example. Let's say you're a fifth grader and pretty popular, got a whole lunch crowd that you often sit with, but one day you stay a um, little bit longer in the classroom prior to lunch. And when you go get your lunch, that table's full. So you just walk over to another table and sit down where there's an empty space next to someone else. And you strike up a conversation with that kid and it's kind of a nice kid and <clears throat> you um, had a fine lunch and then you stand up to go take your dishes in so you can go play soccer at recess and the kid says thank you for sitting with me nobody's done that all this year yet and you go like wow you know when i think of it this corner of the lunchroom does often have a kid that's sitting alone how interesting so that story is about a spontaneous act of peacemaking. The conscious act of peacemaking starts the next day. When the kid walks out of the lunch line and decides where to sit, what does he do? That's the difference. Okay, so um, I want to take you through these items. It's rather quick. It will take only about five minutes. But this is, um, this is a list of 24 things that I kept seeing coming up as I wrote up these women's stories. It's not rocket science. I have to tell you, doing an act of conscious peacemaking is a bunch of simple steps. Um, so it's not magic, um, but when you put them all together, it works. So if you want, you could just close your eyes and listen to these one sentence items that I'm gonna read. Number one, be awake when the opportunity presents itself. Number two, develop your service in response to people's expressed sense of need. When listening for this, be sure that you're listening to understand their needs, 
rather than listening to validate your preconceived idea of what is needed. Number three, never lose sight of your goal and never get attached to how you get there. Number four, learn who the local peacemakers are and be respectful of their peacemaking traditions. Number five, every day revisit the wisdom of and your willingness to continue this work. Number six, operate from unconditional caring, not from sentimentality. Number seven, making a difference in the world might be your primary form of compensation rather than financial compensation. If you need money to do your work, be creative about sourcing it. Number eight, work under the radar of oppression when called for. Number nine, work with and not for, work alongside those who request your services. Number 10, acknowledge, validate, and nurture the strength of those with whom you work. Number 11, work simultaneously at both the individual and the systems level. Number 12, pace yourself. Make a little peace, make a little dinner. Know that your work might not be completed in your lifetime. Number 13, be aware that peacemaking may be, but does not have to be dangerous. Provide for your safety. Number 14, be willing to hang out on the margins of society without taking it personally. Number 15, practice patience and persistence. Employ them both simultaneously. Number 16, most of your learning will be on the job training or osmosis from other peacemakers. Observe what your mentors do and don't do and why. Number 17, First, go small and deep with your work. Then think about the wisdom of going bigger. Many peacemakers stay small and deep. Number 18, sometimes anger works as a good motivator, but it is an unwise and dangerous plan of action. Number 19, rising out up, rising up out of a depression can launch amazing acts of peacemaking. Likewise, doing an act of peacemaking can, but doesn't always dispel depression. Provide for your mental healthiness. Number 20, do not use violence of any kind, including to yourself. Number 21, when making choices, Choose what keeps you in integrity with your goals and your conscience. Number 22, pray. Number 23, the amount of outside pressure you may feel from these, those that disapprove of your work may be great. Meet it with a greater amount of inner resolve, integrity, and grit. And number 24, when overwhelmed by what you can't do, refocus on what you can do and then proceed with the next right thing. So with all that help, all these incredible stories and their direct advice on what to do if you wanna be a peacemaker and then just seeing those 24 fairly simple things that you could do. I invite each of you that are listening to this presentation to um, do an act of peacemaking and then to send it in to me, write it up in a page or page and a half and send it in to me. Oh my gosh, we're gonna have the whole problem. 
of, let's see. Um, I will just hold it up like this. Send it to me at that email address. I'll show this again at the end. And uh, give me permission to uh, make it public because I am in the business of collecting more and more peacemaker stories. So let me just do this, it'll help. I'm actually gonna read you a story that I just got uh, uh, this last week and give you an idea of how someone met that requirement. Give me a second here. And let's see if we can make this a little bit easier. See if this works any better. How about that? There you go. So let me read you a story by a woman named Diane King. Last summer, I purchased a new condominium and was cleaning and painting before moving. While removing curtains, I saw my new upstairs neighbor and called out to her and introduced myself. The following day, I saw Ellen again, and she asked if I had put a spoon down her disposal. This was my first indication that something may be amiss with my neighbor. After I moved in, on the weekends, I heard Ellen yelling and crying. She frequently opened her door and yelled out, you shut up. Some of my other neighbors visited me on the porch as I was sweeping and getting cleaned up. One said, don't talk to your neighbor, she's crazy, and pointed upstairs. Others from the community said similar things. Instead of ignoring Ellen, I made friends with her. It became apparent that she probably suffers from schizophrenia. She hears voices and says it's the neighbor and the, her next door neighbor and his children. She's convinced that he has wired her house so that he can say mean things to her. She frequently sends a text asking if I hear the voices. I tell her no. She tends to wear black every day because the voices say that she's fat and she thinks this will make her look thinner. Sometimes she sit, it sits in her car in the parking lot, <clears throat> using it like an office instead of going inside. She said the voices aren't in the car. One day I gave her decorated paper with words on it that said, whatever the voices say, the opposite is true. She carried this paper from room to room and back and forth to her car. So I printed several more copies and gave them to her. She said she reads them regularly and has them in every room. At Thanksgiving, Ellen brought me a piece of apple pie. Just before Christmas, she brought a small bag with wrapped chocolates tied with a ribbon with the words love. In February, she gave me a Valentine card. For Easter, she gave me a small bag with a colored egg and some jelly beans. We exchanged little gifts like this regularly. On nice days, I invite Ellen to bring her lunch downstairs and we sit on my porch and eat and talk. Ellen's disability does not stop her from being a good neighbor. She's nicer than some of the other people I've met here. She's also very bright. When her hot water heater broke, the water caused damage to my utility closet and left a water stain on the ceiling. When I asked if she had called the insurance company, she said they were closed on the weekend. She gave me the name of her insurance company and, and I came to my place and looked up their 24 hour service number and then returned upstairs where I helped her call the company and file a claim for herself and for me. The insurance company sent people to clean up the water damage immediately. Another new neighbor has befriended Ellen. He brought her a heart-shaped box of candy for Valentine's Day. He had an impromptu party for about 10 neighbors and invited Ellen. She ate the snacks and drank the soda and chatted with folks at the party. We walked home together when the party was over and she said, I've lived here for nine years and no one has ever invited me to anything. This was so nice. 
Others who have lived here longer have told me stories about some of Ellen's behaviors that scared people. Most folks tell me that Ellen is much nicer when, since I moved in. What I notice is that Ellen does much better when someone talks to her regularly. That's pretty easy to do since we're neighbors. She still has her moments. They're not as frequent and not as long. If I hear her calling out, I pop my head out the door and ask what's going on. She de-escalates very quickly and we both go about our business. So as you can see, the opportunity for doing an act of peacemaking is everywhere. It might be in your relationship with someone else. It might be at your school. It might be in your, where, you, where you live. It might be between you and mother nature. You might start having different habits. If you consider mother nature as someone that you want to show equal respect to, it might be something, um, another example for me is that I have uh, donated money to an organization called Women for Women for years. They give it to a woman, she gets a six month training and she writes a letter to me and I never answered those letters for a long time. And I thought, well, that's not a conscious act of peacemaking. So now when the letters come, I return the letter to them. The donation's the same, but the personal one-on-one -on -one interaction between us, that makes it a conscious act of peacemaking. So there is the invitation. There is the story about the book and the women peacemakers in the world. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions that might come up. So um, on Facebook, um, when you were talking about one of the ladies, mm -hmm. Janet said, um, she must be very alarmed at the current perilous path we seem to be on. This is a woman from Iraq? Um, I think so, yes. Yes, I have not had contact with her in the last year, but um, I have that anxiety. Um, have, being this close and seeing what it has done to families of people that I've interviewed, it's like I have barely been able to sleep during the Iraq, the Afghanistan situation. And I also will say this, I was at a peace, global peace conference um, several years ago, and a woman who was the head of the Red Crescent, which is the same as the Red Cross, who was from Afghan, was talking to all of us. And she said, I'll never forget, she said, we mothers in Afghanistan, it was never safe for our kids. The Russians came, and then the Americans came, and then the Taliban came and we were just petrified that our kids were never gonna make it. And someone came to us and said, we'll take your kids outside the country and we'll teach them. We'll school them there so they'll be safe. And we all went like, oh, thank you, thank you. We had no idea that they were jihadi schools. And then she never said anything for about another whole minute. And the whole audience just went like, Oh my God. So yes, I would imagine that Shahala, having lived through it once, is anguished as are anybody else. I mean, we Americans are pretty darn lucky. If anybody ought to be reaching out with acts of peacemaking, it's us. We have it pretty easy. We have the energy, we have the food, we have the money, we have the education to take advantage of an opportunity to do a peacemaking act. So um, yes, back to the question. Um, I would imagine that Shahala is like really worried about it. Okay. So there's one other, um, not as much of the question, but a comment um, oh. is in Aragaki says, Afghan women need our support. I have been working with the Afghan Women Con Council can we brainstorm? PM me. Would you like to give her your email? I know I saw it up on the screen before. Yes, absolutely, I would. In fact, earlier on this program, on day one, I uh, read a, a whole bunch of responses, nonviolent responses to 9-11. And several of those responses were from the Afghan women's organizations. So 
I would be more than happy. Let me just leave it up here. It's the top line. Barb.chambliss44 at gmail.com. And remind me again of the, the name of the person who asked for that. Uh, Susan Aragaki. Okay. I guess I'm more than happy to brainstorm together and I'm interested in the, her willingness to bring up that topic. That's all I, the I don't right. see any on the chat here. So, and I think we're doing fine. I think maybe we've, it's time to close this session and we'll see if I get any stories, peacemaker stories. They are welcome. <laughs>